Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hi, I'm Lindsay Shepard. I'm a fellow in the International Security Program here at CSIS. It's such a pleasure today to welcome Michael Kanan for his talk on his new book, T-Minus AI, Humanity's Countdown to Artificial Intelligence and the New Pursuit of Global Power. Michael Kanan was the first chairperson of, the artificial, intel of artificial Intelligence for the US Air Force. He is currently the Director of Operations for the Air Force MIT Artificial Intelligence Accelerator. And in 2019, he was listed as one of the Forbes 30 under 30 for his work in enterprise technology. Welcome, Mike, to CSIS. It is, I'm looking forward to sharing our conversation today, and it's wonderful to have you. Lindsay, it's good to be with you today, uh, as always, and with CSIS, because I'm always so inspired by the conversations you guys hold and uh, the topics that are hand, which are truly the conversations of our generation. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, so let's get started with T-minus AI. Uh, so one thing that really struck me when I read the book um, is you really weave this compelling narrative of artificial intelligence for your, for your readers and for the audience, but you don't actually get to AI and to machine learning until the second part of the book out of three parts. So walk us through what are those foundational concepts that you felt were really critical to understanding where we are today with AI? Well, I'm a fan of starting with analogies. And if I could pick up an electrical outlet behind me or somewhere in our rooms or the microwave in the kitchen while I'm quarantined at home, I'd bring it over. We each have, you know, some of those in our house, I would hope, or maybe I bring over a hammer. For most of us, we do have these things. We're not electricians, but we use electricity. We're not engineers, but we use microwaves. Many of us drive cars, but fewer can build them. And then fewer can both build and code the software we have in our cars today. And all of us use hammers without being master craftspeople. While we may not understand each of these things intimately, we're familiar. And we each of, uh, each of us use these everyday instruments. We can be incredibly effective with them, yet we can also do damage with them. AI itself is a lot like these in certain ways. So first and most importantly, something we all should recognize, because we all have a role to play, is that AI is an extremely powerful tool. It's just that, a tool. But it has far broader reach and immense implications we must consider and evaluate carefully. It's a sharp instrument that shouldn't be callously wielded or just casually accepted, especially if it's in the wrong hands or when it's used for intentionally intrusive or oppressive purposes, back to the point of its reach. And there are serious issues. There are issues for everyone. And there are significant steps we can take to ensure AI is properly designed and implemented in both our personal lives and our professional pursuits. But despite everything at risk, all the conversations, despite it's the fact you see the ads you see every day, the news you read, the news that isn't real, often the music you listen to, the fluctuation of your 401k, you could arguably blame aspects of the stock market crash on early applications of machine learning that a generation of millennials are still paying for per se. For most of us, AI remains shrouded by a cloud of mystery and misunderstanding, and it keeps being hidden behind complex technical terms and then confused by each of us, by our extravagant depictions in science fiction. For most of us, we say, that's not for me. I can't understand that. That's for those tech people out there. And I disagree. Much like electricity, cars, microwaves, and hammers, it will be a part of our lives. And its current state will profoundly impact our interactions. So as I wrote the book, I thought back to books that meant something to me. They're books that not only brought a topic to light, but one to life. They're books like Sagan's Cosmos, Hawking's Universe in a Nutshell, Carol's Something Deeply Hidden, and recently Harari Sapiens. This is a topic we need experience, familiarity, and understanding, and not just for the engineers. In the book, I explain the realities of AI from a human-oriented perspective that's easy to comprehend through our collective history of innovation and technology. Because the topic is truly multidisciplinary. You have to know a little bit about our own evolution, the development of language, the scales of numbers, both big and small. Some of 
basics of history, of course, how a computer works at a basic level, how your own brain works most definitely. Then let's discuss what is AI. Because without that context, it's the same circular conversation where we too often speak above, below, past, and through one another. And after that, let's get to the big stuff in part three, the global implications of AI and the cultural and national and, and personal vulnerabilities, competition in business, and international relations alike already exposed and the pressing issues squarely on the table. Let's make clear. AI has already become China's all-purpose tool to impose authoritarian influence around the world. Russia is weaponizing AI through its military systems and now infamous aggressive efforts to disrupt democracy by whatever disinformation means possible. And other nations, America and the like-minded ones, we're of course too awakening to these new realities, but ultimately it's this simple. The paths we elect to follow, that is nations, that is our personal lives, that is organizations, that's business, echo loudly the political foundations and the moral imperatives upon which we were formed or what we value. But in order to talk about any of those aspects in a meaningful way, we need all the legs to the tripod. And ultimately we learn best through storytelling, storytelling about what makes us, us. And for me, the human experience is best told through the lens of AI. And those stories we're talking about in part one, they're there, it's true. As a personal hero and you know, thought leader for myself, as Carl Sagan said, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you first have to invent the universe. The same goes for talking about AI. Well, thank you. You certainly gave us a lot to think about. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't remind the audience um, that we're going to cover a breadth of topics. And please do submit your live questions to us via the event page at CSIS. Um, we left a, a, a wide menu of topics to, to dive into, so please send your best ones to Mike. Um, but I think, you know, Mike, it'd be really interesting, you know, you wove it through that narrative. Um, and I know this is a personal passion of yours um, in, your, in your both professional and personal capacity is really focusing on that human dimension and thinking through how do we educate uh, not just the newcomers to the workforce, but those that are already in the workforce. So how do we think about upskilling and giving them the tools um, that they need to be successful in an age where AI has to be, um, you know, it has to be a second language and it has to be a comfortable language. Um, I think your book does a certainly a great job at laying that foundation, but where do we go from here? How do we tackle the education? Here's the reality. This year, the United States is going to graduate 50,000 people with STEM-like degrees for 500,000 open jobs. But we live in a world where the barriers to education have never been lower. I don't care if you have a college degree or not. Have you done it? Can you do it? Do you have a passion to learn it? How do we, as a nation, help drive down the gap is what matters right now. Because in only a few short years, insert kind of a Dr. Evil reference here, there'll be 1 million open jobs in this space. And we need to reimagine what education is. And by the way, we often get hung up on discussing well, how do we do more STEM? And that's important. Listen, contemporary education in this space and the scale needed is woefully outdated and probably not enough to fill the gap I just mentioned. But we also need the humanities. And maybe that's where some of the failure to launch, pun intended, is right now. I, say, I said tech people earlier comes with a connotation. We have to rid ourselves of thinking that's for someone else, that's not for me. So let's change it. Tech people, who is that in the future? At least to the extent of don't put tinfoil in the microwave or stick that fork in the electrical outlet. For teachers, they're lawyers or sociologists or psychologists, they're parents. That's where we need to get to. Most importantly though, I think the underlying theme, both here today and pretty on display, but also yesterday in the past, maybe we didn't notice as much, and most definitely moving forward in the future for our workforces and our populace is the reminder that learning is a lifetime sport. And at these moments, especially catalyzed by topics that can engage and inspire, we need to bring that back. Here's what I know. Whatever the policies are, we can all agree that we need a populace that's more informed, more cognizant, some experts, some not. The thing that matters most now is to create a common dialogue that you mentioned, a common language on what the technology is 
and how we can grow a workforce for the future to use it for whatever future they see fit. This is about the education of our youth right now. And we do all have a role to play, whether you're in public service or private business. And that's where the focus should be. I'm reminded by that quote uh, that you're talking about with language from the 19th century German philosopher Wittgenstein, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. That's pretty apropos of 2020 in a lot of ways, and especially discussing this thing in our lives that's not going to go anywhere. No, I think that's that's a, a good quote. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful example. And I know you and I talk about this often um, on, you know, from a variety of applications. Are you in defense? Are you in medicine? Are you in healthcare? Are you in finance? If you don't have the language to write what it is that I need and what I want to bring into my enterprise, um, that language is never going to be written. But I also like that you you called out not just the importance of having a a STEM background and STEM talent. You really call out, this is everybody. And I think nowhere is this more important than when we talk about how do we do machine learning ethically and address the bias. So for perhaps for an audience that may not know, um, you know, kind of why and how is machine learning biased um, and how do we tackle it? Lay that out for us. Machine learning applications are designed to analyze data and formulate predictions without any overall guidance from us. There it is. That's what AI is. Once upon a time, and I know that you have this in your background and your engineering career, we had to explicitly provide directions to our machines and largely probably know what the output would most likely be. And find out we're really bad at giving directions. That's that's fair too, right? this This is good though, because machine learning is a lot like looking in the mirror. Now we just express mathematics in language to machines to allow them discover patterns. Think about it, I don't have to necessarily change each and every variable. It discovers that. That's the goal of AI, to discover human patterns. And that's not gonna change. That doesn't mean, however, that machine learning is necessarily safe from the effects or influences of our human biases. It's not. Just because an algorithm's analysis is based only on data doesn't mean its output is neutral or objectively fair. Human biases are reflected in our data because it's akin to experience because we memorialize now the interactions of ourselves, the interaction happening between you and I, the whole world nowadays. We once you know, asked if a tree falls in a forest, does it make a sound? And it's like, well, outside of some very philosophical conversations, of course it did. The question we should ask was <laughs> something there to record it, right? So it stands to reason that any analysis, strategy, or prediction based on data will be biased as well. And worse, if decisions are made uh, or actions are taken based on that analysis, then the underlying biases will, of course, perpetuate and possibly ingrain historical and cultural inequities even deeper into our lives. Now, the steps necessary to ensure it doesn't happen, they're difficult to accomplish, but they're not impossible. They just require conscientious and concerted efforts at the development and training stages of machine learning algorithms. So so getting them and figuring out what you're gonna do with them, but then they require attentive analysis and oversight at the implementation and use stages because they're changing. AI is a journey, not a singular now, product or just end state. The first and most important step though, and what I think is important, is to say and understand the underlying nature of the problem at hand. Most of us believe that we're fully aware and consciously in control of our biased inclinations and our opinions, and that we're able to intentionally include or exclude them however we see fit during you know, the never ending course of the day of all the decisions we make, but we're not. The truth is we're not able to separate ourselves from our biases or I guess our biases from ourselves, very meta. We aren't even aware of many prejudices we hold and we're unaware accordingly of the many ways they influence our behavior. So regardless of how objective, enlightened, or unbiased we think we are, we each have underlying unconscious tendencies and tastes, right? Right along with aversions and distastes. That defines who we are. And they influence, you know, to the extent, most everything we actually do. It's not a bad thing, though. Bias doesn't have to have that word, right? It stops me from walking in front of a car in some ways. But the concern is this. When our thoughts, preferences, and actions are memorialized in the data we create all around us, 
so too are the biases. Unavoidably, they will reflect patterns that evidence base attitudes and inclinations or how you go about business. And when it's made to machine learning system, the algorithm is going to discover those patterns. There is no doubt about that. That's the purpose of it. The problem, though, is this. It's difficult for AI to determine if those patterns or behaviors are based on fair and desirable attributes or their unfair and undesirable prejudices. Now, this matters more for, than ever. And it's a liability, right? This is what makes us different, holding these conversations. And it's one I hope we just pay attention to. And at least if we have this, this isn't meant to be pedantic. If we recognize this up front, we'll make smarter choices in the future. Well, I appreciate that you you gave us some teasers on, you know, how do you actually implement this and where do we go? Um, you know, a variety of a variety of organizations and institutions are putting out high level principles that uh, codify nice goals that they sound good and they're admirable. But, you know, it really comes down to when the rubber meets the road, how do you put these into practice? And so I very much appreciate that you gave us some, you know, practical, what does this look like in implementation? Um, but you alluded to, you know, this is something that you have to consciously do. And I promise I'm going to weave this into a thread with to a question. Uh, but in your book, you introduce moments that awaken nations. Um, and you reference the Sputnik moment, which comes up so often in, in our world in AI, uh, because we often wonder, is this a Sputnik moment for the US? Um, but when you write about this, uh, you're not writing about the United States. Uh, the moment that has awoken a nation for AI is not us. Um, and so this gets into how do you address bias? How do you implement? So tell us about what is AI's moment, who had it, and what are the implications? When we use the term Sputnik moment, we're talking about 1957. There are not many people who are working or totally remember the Sputnik moment necessarily working today. And, but we use it. We bandy it around like, oh, what is that? When I wrote Moments That Awaken Nations, I wanted to put the reader into that moment in 1957. At the same time, you know, the World Series is going on and the New York Yankees are playing the upstart Milwaukee Braves. And it was a night off, right? And all of a sudden, word from government and around, people started streaming out into their yards, right? And this is at a time where, you know, we're two-time World War winners. Life is good. We feel safe, right? And they walk out and they realize that there's this thing floating overhead, overhead of me, my geographic safe location. There's a Russian satellite overhead. Now what we miss out on this is we forget what was terrifying about that, that you know, instilled the Sputnik moment, why we use this word. It was the ICBM capability to launch that was truly terrifying. We weren't so safe anymore. So I wanted to put the reader into that moment. Now I ask this question, artificial intelligence. In my mind, it's compromised and pretty much ruined the game of baseball in some ways, right? America's pastime. I mentioned you can blame it on the stock market crash a little bit. We can blame it on the fact that I believe, and I know you believe link on, uh, Lindsay on LinkedIn, that pretty much the whole world's talking about AI, but I'm only presented that information in my echo chamber. We see advancements in language technology where it doesn't know what it's saying, but it creates coherent language. That's disconcerting. It makes art, right? It is all around us. And yet, why aren't we waking up to that moment? Because other countries did have that moment because it, it changed them and shook them to their core on a cultural pillar and topic. It was chess for Russia. Make no mistake, Russia prided itself on its long history, which I talk about, of their chess winning capabilities and their intellectual superiority, despite their lack of natural resources necessarily, right? For China, most of us don't even quite comprehend what the game of Go, A, we don't know what it is for the most part, and B, just what it means to China itself culturally. It's a pillar of their culture itself. And these two things fell to machines and it rocked them to their core. And they had a long enough history to say that intellectually changed me. Now, my concern is right now is what does it take for America to have that same exact moment? 
And we often pride ourselves on saying, you know, at a time of the nation's need, America will respond. Well, there's no preordained right to doing that. Well, we've done it five or six times, yet we know the tea leaves. What I hope that we can inspire, especially in our youth and for everyday people, is let's talk about this now. Let's turn that corner so that we can make the argument that I'm, you know, I'm sure we'll get to about why you know, doing good, you can also do well. And we have to make that argument now. So I know we often talk about, uh, you know, the, the big bads in this arena. So what are China and what are Russia doing? Um, and it's really easy to focus on those adversarial activities and where folks are getting it wrong, where we're getting it wrong. Um, but as you look out globally, um, I'd like to know who's getting it right. Are there, are there nations and entities that are doing things that uh, we in the U.S. should be doing well? Um, or are we doing things and we're getting it right? Of course, for some context, yes. Let's recognize that if the premise is that data wins out, data makes AI better, which it does, then those who operate under this idea of digital authoritarianism that we're concerned about do have at least somewhat tactical technological advantage. I write about this in the book. But many of us also, when we try to discuss it, when we try to talk about what is doing good look like, don't quite comprehend just what it's like in some of these places when it comes to the collection of data to subsequently make machine learning. So on my phone right now, I have options. Uber, Lyft, Postmates, Scrubhub, Chrome, Internet Explorer. Well, maybe not anymore. Don't use that. Or I know Lindsay can't stand and doesn't like my text, which pop up green, you know, that whole, you're an apple, I'm a droid. Doesn't nope, like get it. get an apple. <laughs> China doesn't have that. Some of these countries don't. You want to order a dog walker, want to pay at the grocery store, want to order food, want to talk to your loved ones, want to share what you're thinking about. One application, all collected. So there's the advantage that we're concerned about. But how do we shift the narrative and provide a different value proposition? What I'm hopeful for is this rise that the idea that I've kind of mentioned, which is probably not reflected in a quarterly earnings report, is that we can do well by doing right and doing good. So where I think we're getting it right, where countries are, is actually in a lot of ways where we make mistakes. Microsoft's chatbot Tay, they took that down. Amazon changing its operations because of what machine learning illuminated in the biases they carried in hiring action. John Oliver having a bit about Uyghur China just a few weeks ago. It's a big deal. It's the conversation in Western like-minded nations saying, how do we think about fair and representative collection of data to build algorithms that can affect us all? The slow phase rollout of OpenAI's GPT-3 now, the standup of ethics boards that you discussed, the creation of the National Security Commission on AI, that's where we're getting it right. Now, where we really launch and build in that holistic conversation and participation, that's, that's good. More of that. And I mentioned representation. The question to ask is, are we representing all of us in the data in this nation? I want to celebrate and also accelerate how we address the digital divide in this country. And in order to do the things I just mentioned or to make better applications that are more fair. I recently did a hackathon for the city of Detroit, my hometown, barn burner 72 hours over the weekend, helping address the fact that 40% of the city doesn't have internet access. That's not just Detroit, that's other cities, that's rural communities. If we're gonna shift the narrative, we're gonna come from it from this intellectual sophisticated foundation to make an argument that say, trade capability, perhaps, in order to do right, to see the world, we got to come at it from a technological development standpoint, literally, that what we need to do is make sure everyone's represented in the scope of the application. We've discussed that before. Data is its worldview. How many people does it affect? Let's make sure that they're represented in data. I think that's where countries are getting it right. And you see that in the European Union. You see it in other places. And that's discussed in part three of the book. So one last question before we open it up to the audience, and you alluded to this a little bit in your, um, in your previous answer on kind of setting the stage. Um, so one, you know, I would love for you to help our audience understand 
you know, as we're talking about, you know, the benefits of authoritarian nations um, sucking up all the data, but what type of work has to go into making that usable? So you have it. Are you actually able to use it and implement it? Are you able to get, you know, returns on that data? You hint at, you know, needing to have that backbone of internet, needing to have the right IT networks. Um, and so I think, you know, this is kind of the question of, you know, in engineering, you know, when we start a project in, in, in AI encoding, when you start a project, you can't, you know, just sit down and start, you know, banging away at the keyboard and hope that you're going to get it. You have to decide and define upfront and early, what does success look like? What does this look like when I get this right? How will I know I have done it? So if AI is the thing, how do we know, what is it going to look like when we get it right? How will we know we've done the thing as a, as a nation? It's interesting you mention that because when we say say AI and you're talking about the engineering process, the scientific method, when we say AI, it's like we we throw the kitchen sink out, we throw the kitchen and the living room out the window. We say, whoa, nothing can work with this. When when largely there are frameworks that do work. Now, I'm not going to say and 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 allow us to say there aren't moments where we are trying to fit square pegs and round holes and we need to start carving out some new square pegs. And the question you ask is a monumental one because we're at the beginning. The full implications and effect of these technologies remain to be seen in just short months, years, and of course, decades ahead. I start the book with this sentence, the countdown to AI is over, period. Because of what exists now, if there is no advancement, it will still change a lot. And what I know is that we're at an inflection point in the history of our time. What we do with respect to this will impact our present, future, and perhaps where we go as a society. The strengths though of this free nation and democratically represented people are and always will be the ability to cooperatively work together in order to preserve individual liberties and our decided, personally, it's ways of life. So it's no time to disconnect with one another or be passive or distracted. Because the story is only beginning, understanding it and its potential, both good and bad, is essential. And I think caring is what's most crucial. So one thing I guess I've learned over time is that our best leadership takes its cues from the needs of its ranks. And likewise, democracy takes direction from the voice of its people. And while no system is perfect, democracy does give standing to people for the fundamental purpose of ensuring their needs are heard and rights generally are protected. But ideally, those voices are informed and at least generally aware of the conflicts and potential compromises they face. Effective democracy stands on that. There are moments in our personal lives and professions when we look in the mirror, we ask ourselves, do I understand what I'm talking about? Do I get the values and ideas and directions I'm espousing? Do I even know a little how to get there? We're here now. Regardless of the demographic, young and old, senior leader, management, subordinate, everyday person like we each need to look in the mirror at this point. I like the idea of teaming the techniques of the old with the ideas of the new. Your boardroom, the people you talk to, should probably look a little bit different than it does right now. I mean, truly, age doesn't dictate experience in this new domain. How long could you have possibly been working on the current state of AI? Seven, eight years? Maybe. In fact, a young person or someone different than you might be the most experienced person you have to offer on a strategic imperative. So what it looks like at the end of the day is a little bit like Field of Dreams. Build it and they'll come, allowing the next generation of leader to make the future they need and the one they will actually end up dealing with. Being humble enough for each of us to answer the question you just asked with, I don't know, but I want to help you get there. Again, this is about the journey. Well, in true Mike fashion, you have teed us up perfectly for our first question. And I imagine you know who this is from. Uh, so your old boss, Jack Shanahan, would like to know that with the benefit of a couple of years of experience and the book behind you, um, how do we get going down this road? So what are the three most important things that an enterprise can do to accelerate the adoption across uh, of AI across that enterprise. Help us get hmm. going down this path. Let's get pragmatic on the topic. We're gonna listen to the young guy now, so. 
Go, young guy. Uh, let's talk about trust. Like, what do we need to do to get there? From a very academic perspective, trust is, is, is you know, people talk about it. As recent as 2010, we've realized that in studies, there is not yet a shared or prevailing, clear and convincing notion of trust in general, right? So we ask ourselves at these moments, how do I build trust back to the microwave, the car, the hammer and all that stuff and the, the oven. And, you know, I, I'm terrified of my Instapot because uh, it's like a bomb, but you know, whatever uh, I use it. So we got to talk about building experience. I think where we're failing is not diving in, diving in on what are seemingly toy problems. So number one, solve a toy problem. What do I mean by that? If you're a business out there in the world and you have some strategic goal, right? Any strategic goal, big product that you're trying to rebuild. Let's say you're trying to remake nanomaterials using graphene in some crazy new way. And you're like, I must have AI for that. Or what if you're trying to, you know, use simulation environments and AI to create a COVID vaccine, something like that, right? You take on these huge, huge, huge problems. When you're better served, exercising the underlying technique on a toy problem. If I was using some sort of algorithm to discover an uh, anomalies in, let's say, s prescription abuse in a dental clinic or, or at a medical clinic, right? That is quite literally the same technique you would use in all sorts of big strategic things you would want to work on in your business and personal lives. So number one, we aren't starting with toy problems enough. The second piece is not, and, and in line with this, is taking a step back and doing the non-fun stuff right now, the really not fun stuff. The reality is, is that the tactical choices of today are the strategic decisions of tomorrow. Let me give you an example. Many of us operate on legacy computers and software in all of our lives, they're old computers. So someone say, I wanna work on AI, of course they do, right? But then you have a workforce that you then say, oh, well, what kind of software suite are you, are you on? They'll say, well, Python 3.5, surely at the moment, it's my computer's old. Well, frankly, you're never gonna be able to onboard the machine learning applications of today or that the future workforce is even learning if you don't start doing the dirty work and being informed to make tactical choices at the highest levels. And that lends itself back into the education issue. What I'm very concerned about is that in this new age, what we end up doing is saying, AI, that's for those IT people. What we wanna build into our enterprises is whether you are a doctor, whether you're a psychologist, wh whatever world you work in, your field has to see the responsibility of developing AI in your everyday life. It can't be for the coders and programmers, right? It can't just be for the IT department to do some security on. We have to build that into each of our lives and tap the latent talent that already exists, the citizen coder. So those would be the three pieces I would focus on uh, first. And it all centers around the idea, data, software, talent, algorithms. Just break it down like that and pragmatically approach each one. So it's a nice segue. We have a question from a, a person who's actually read the book. So uh, from Patrick Cronin at Hudson says, you write in chapter seven, that quote, everything AI applications are capable of doing depends on the quality and completely of the information available to them. So what are those biggest challenges for AI for validating um, not just the accuracy, but also mm -hmm. the completeness of the information and data that you're, you're running through your program? Well, I'm very excited that someone read the book. It's only been out for three days, so that makes me happy. Um, okay, I had mentioned special attentiveness throughout the whole process of this thing. You don't just go buy a bunch of AI and end up doing it. It's, it's more about the journey. And we had discussed that our biases and everything that we do are gonna be reflected in the data set itself. There are plenty of significant and commendable efforts on things like explainability, just announced very recently. But I always find myself at times when I use words, especially when talk about AI or like quantum mechanics, I wanna say consciousness. And I'm like, well, I don't quite mean that word, right? I, I sort of mean that word. 
I need some new words to, to work through this entire process, right? I think that's a lot like what we're talking about right here and right now is we need a little bit better words to define what we need to pay attention to and how we pay attention to the data we make. But then we use the word like explainability and we say, well, if I have to be attentive, then the, then the machine must surely tell me how did it make this decision? How do I monitor the completeness? But we've anthropomorphized the answer. So Lindsay, just for a quick thought experiment, I think I've probably done it with you before. You're sitting on a chair at the moment, right? Damn. How do you know that's a chair? Oh man, this is taking me back to after, philosophy in undergrad. <laughs> after 29 years of life, you're sitting back and saying to yourself, well, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of examples of chairs. I've seen a lot of chairs. I know what they look like. I know, you know how they work. Sometimes they have a few legs. Sometimes they have more. I can sit on them. If you asked a machine learning application, why did it make the decision it made? It would say, well, based on the 80 terabytes of data you gave me, that's the pattern I discovered. That simple. And this gets back to the question itself. What I think about is at least paying attention at the start because we're not going to have a way to measure completeness because we can't measure completeness in our own lives. But what I like to think about is if we thought of it in an X and Y axis, and maybe this could, you know, yield some at least understanding in legislation and at least a way to think about it. If on the Y axis, we all agree that uh, data is akin to experience. Mm -hmm. So we put data there and worldview. And then on the X axis, we think about, well, how much does that, how many people does that affect? So for instance, a telephone switch operator, and you and I have gone through this before in this thought experiment, doesn't necessarily need an entirely large worldview. But your Alexa definitely shouldn't be only trained on people from Georgia or people from California, right? Because it affects us all. That would work well for me. <laughs> well, that would work well for you. Um, but see, that's the unfairness that could come out. So how do we measure completeness? I would say that at the start of every single machine learning project, you say, does that seem fair and representative of the number of people it will affect? while simultaneously we wait for the R&D to catch up to explain it to us. Awesome. Well, we have one from Dan McGurkin at United States Marine Corps that I, it's a long one, uh, but I very much appreciate this question uh, because we, we often in this conversation will talk about AI as if it is infallible um, and Dan wants to know how it's not. So he says, there are potentially troubling implications of AI in the realm of national security. Some hypothesize that a primary role of AI will be to synthesize vast and comprehensible amounts of data from a myriad of sensors, ultimately presenting a well-ordered picture of the chaos to key decision makers. This would make algorithms themselves a prized high-value target for any malicious actor seeking to influence or do harm to a population. And so all of this is really hinting at um, how can we exploit the vulnerabilities of artificial intelligence? So what are those vulnerabilities um, that AI introduces into systems that, that are now exploitable and out and open in the world? We could have done the 45 minutes on this. Uh, we it's could. A, it's a great question. We'll, do, we'll right. come back next week. <laughs> we'll come back next week for everyone if you want to dial in. We'll do a LinkedIn Live. Um, okay. The first thing I think that we would be well served by when we discuss AI is we need to break apart, and it's more like a Venn diagram, the words automation from artificial intelligence. Okay, so number one, when we are worried about the exploits that it will present, and we think to ourselves, well, I'm using AI to make every decision that I have, I would say, wait, 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 are you actually doing that? Because let me give the first primer on the best place to start an AI project. You don't start it at the bottom of your workforce. Start at the top of your workforce with your subject matter experts. And we get this wrong all the time. And businesses get this wrong. You want to focus on things that are very, very high volumes of data, like a person can't handle, that move at high velocities right, that you need these decisions quickly. This is like in the stock market, for instance, that's why they use AI there. And you want to be highly accurate. You must necessitate accuracy. Because what you're trying to do is you're, with AI is you're trying to implement it in a manner where for the strategic decision maker, the subject matter expert, you're getting rid of the minutia of their life 
so they can think big and illuminate patterns they would have never found. So that's number one. So let's start with, that's a good place to start. And we wonder how it could be exploited because we flip it around with this idea of automation, which that's gonna be the thing that takes jobs before AI does. AI just illuminates patterns and helps us make smart choices. Now, that is not to say, however, that if along the entire line, we're saying that to the last question, we need to be attentive on data collection. We need to be attentive on its completeness. Then we have to watch it in action. Then I got to reevaluate the whole time. It's, that's a lot of stuff, right? Again, this is still a human endeavor. And when we're allowing machines to work between machines, we're we're, we could be concerned about the vulnerabilities that would necessarily be exposed. Like if I flip a pixel on an image that our human eye can't detect, that could compromise every subsequent machine learning application coming from that data in a lot of terrible ways. And we wouldn't know any better. So the point is, is pick projects that are along, you know, the observation and orienting side of what we do in business. We're trying to see new patterns. So ultimately we implement new strategies. And then the last piece is for a long time, computers and software, even in our private pursuits, were things to be just protected. I don't think it's insignificant and it's a distinction with a difference to realize that this thing that's right in front of me, it can also be used. And when our workforces think about things in that way, perhaps to that question, we'll actually focus on the concerns of the vulnerabilities it does expose. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so I think we have time for at least one more question um, and we're going to, to pivot to uh, back to data, um, but from the legal angle. So we have a question from Zachary Gurev at Harvard Law. He writes, given the importance of large quantities of data in training machine learning systems, um, can you speak about uh, a bit about the implications for the legal regimes and the policy regimes uh, surrounding personal data privacy um, from the, the Western angle? So thinking US, Europe. I'm uh, very concerned about, about this topic and, our, and, our, and I'm guilty of this, just hitting yes to a user service agreement, right? I mean, ultimately that's what it comes down to. We don't have enough of a sophisticated foundation as a society to say, wait a second, wait a second. I'm not so okay with that. At the same time, I have everything in my smart home. I have a Nest, I have Alexa, I have Google Home because, well, I would, pre I would prefer that I'm represented in the data, right? That I work with my AI because it, again, it only makes it better. So we stand at this precipice that if in commercial world, which, you know, free market economy and everything else that we pride ourselves on, if the idea is get more data to do better, then you would imagine what a slippery slope that presents for us. Yet there aren't a lot of conversations to say, is that right or is that wrong? So back to the education. But another piece that I think we're running into right now is where this all comes together. That is freedom of speech, privacy, and anonymity. I think this is an interesting topic that not a lot is being done right now on anonymity. And whether that, that type of work is granted through the idea of privacy and freedom of speech. I mean, think about it. If, uh, if, if, if Hamilton claimed that he was Aaron Burr signing the Federalist Papers, our founding fathers been like, wait, 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 wait. You have a right to privacy and freedom of speech to write that, but you can't claim to be untruthful in somebody else, right? So I think when it relates to data, where it really comes down to is a question about anonymity, which I saw, which I wish I saw more on the topic. And right now, it's the dirty work. I wish we were carving out more square pegs when and if necessary, because the framework doesn't quite work as much anymore. Um, but but from a legal standpoint, that's and and I commend so many people working, you know, in Congress on this. Absolutely, uh, but but I think it requires a consensus from the people to say what's right and what's wrong. And we're lacking that. So it's just a small group thinking, well, is that right or is it wrong? Awesome, well, thank you. We are running close to time. Um, so I wanna give you a moment, uh, one, you know, extend my thanks to you so much for joining us uh, virtually. Um, I'm sorry we were not able to do this in person, but this is the next best thing, we made it work. 
Um, and, you know, I really look forward to, um, you know, seeing your book continue growing its audience. Um, but I want to give you the opportunity, you know, any, any quick closing thoughts, uh, topics we didn't hit on um, before we sign off. No, I'm just appreciative to you and to CSIS and to everyone listening now who wants to be a part of the conversation. I think at this moment in time, no matter who you are, it's just having the dialogue at home, trying to inspire other people, because as I mentioned, it's ultimately going to be a reflection of ourselves. And there's a whole new generation who will deal with the choices that we make right now, whether that's in business or whether that's in society. Let's just help have the conversation so that they're not pigeonholed into a future they don't want because they're the ones who are going to deal with it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to our audience. Um, you know, I, I commend the book to you, T-AI minus uh, by Michael Kanan, um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, Lindsay.